I have wanted to make this video for so long. <laughs> if you have ever read any of Cassandra Clare's Shadowhunters masterpieces, you know that there is a depth to that writing that is just hard to achieve. It is truly impressive to have such a large cast of characters and to feel like I know each of them so deeply. Sometimes when I read series, like, I'll talk about it a week later and I don't even remember the characters' names, whereas with like Cassandra Clare's book, I remember these people like they're actual humans in my life. And while I think this is primarily because she is an amazing writer, I also think it's partly because she's pulling inspiration from proven works of masterpiece writing that have evoked emotional reactions from readers for for decades, if not centuries. So let's discuss because I want to talk about the parallel between them because I think it's so interesting. However, I'm going to be talking about all of the Shadowhunter series. Continue forward at your own risk. If I think there's like just a massive spoiler coming up, I'll put the book on screen, but just generally I recommend reading all of her books. So. First up, we have The Infernal Devices and its cross with A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. This was the first parallel I ever noticed between her books and classic literature. Beyond just the Victorian England background, there's a lot of similarities in the love triangle that we see in both books. So in The Infernal Devices, we have Will Herondale, Jem Carstairs, and Tessa Gray. Even their dynamic sort of parallels what we find in A Tale of Two Cities. Sydney is more of the, I guess like, rambunctious type. A little more hot-headed and that very much fits Will Herondale. And Charles is a little more demure and he is very much like Jen. Both Will and Sydney just have this like deep feeling of like they don't deserve love. And this is part of what causes them to make sort of like the sacrifice that they plan to make while Sydney's is, I guess, successful, whereas Will's isn't. One thing I feel like we see a lot in the Infernal Devices is how Tessa, when she's with Will, it's more of like, kind of like a youthful, like fiery passion where Tessa and Jem is more of like a mature understanding of who the other person is. And that's why both of those relationships feel so perfect on their own and why it's hard to see them together and trying to pick one the whole time. And the thing we see with Sydney and Charles is there, they do have a friendship and obviously Jem and Will are like very close because they're parabatized. And so when Will is sort of pushing Tessa away, it's not just him feeling like he's not worthy of her. It's also him sort of pushing her towards Jem because that's his best friend, like closer than a brother. And he wants that relationship for him no matter how much he actually loves Tessa. And then we see that same dynamic in A Tale of Two Cities where Sydney is pushing Lucy away and eventually he sort of makes the ultimate sacrifice of switching places with Charles in jail so that he dies and Charles can be with Lucy. Luckily, we don't have to deal with that in the Infernal Devices. Arguably, we dealt with something more heartbreaking. <laughs> And of course there are those parallels between Jem and Charles. They're more of your typical hero where I would cast Will more as like morally gray of the two of them. Their goal is to protect the woman that they're in love with and they will go to extreme lengths to do it. We see Jem is addicted to, uh, what is the powder called? I'll find it and put it on the screen. And Charles is completely willing to renounce his whole aristocratic line to be with her. I feel like there are some parallels between Tessa and Lucy. I feel like not as strong as like the boys, but both of them do sort of have to go on their own self-discovery journey, particularly when it comes to like their past and who they are in relation to that with Tessa having to come to the understanding that she is a warlock and that her dad was like evil and Lucy having to find things out about her own family. I don't fully remember like what the revelations were there, but I do know that she had to go and like understand more about her dad. So we have like parallel themes where Will is having to learn how to forgive himself in order to be with Tessa. I feel like Sydney probably forgave himself because he made like that ultimate sacrifice for his friends and their dynamic of like wanting to protect Tessa and Lucy respectively because for Will that means staying away from her and Sydney he has this like sense of loyalty toward Lucy even though he knows that he can't be with her and for a long time Will thinks that he can't be with Tessa either because he was told like as a child that he had a curse that he like could not be loved or could not love something along those lines that made him truly believe that he could not be in a relationship with her however I feel like Cassandra Clare when she was doing this she made a very significant twist to this story in A Tale of Two Cities Sydney is obviously the one that dies and Charles gets to be with Lucy. Whereas in The Infernal Devices, Cassandra Clare in her brilliance switches the script a little bit. So Jem is our character that dies 
becomes a silent brother. So she gets to be with Will, which I feel like is so fitting because like I said before, I feel like Tessa and Will are sort of a, a more, I don't know if youthful relationship is the right term, but it does feel more youthful. And so for her to be able to be with Will when she's in that younger phase of her life, and then for her to be immortal and Will to die. And then she also gets to be with Jem. And that relationship does feel more suited for two more like kind of mature, calmer people. Two, two happy endings from a love triangle. I, I cannot even explain. Like it was oh, such a good, still to this day, this is like one of the best series endings I have ever witnessed. That last chapter where she was talking about her life with Will and then we see her and actually Jem. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> so it was like a good ending to A Tale of Two Cities as opposed to having to necessarily be a tragedy. Also, I feel like there are some parallels to Frankenstein in there because of the automated things. I don't know if there's anything there really, but like the vibes are there for me, like the way they moved and were so creepy and just the general aesthetic environment. I don't know what I'm looking for, but that it felt very similar in those vibes to me. Next is The Last Hours trilogy with great expectations from Charles Dickens, particularly Miss Havisham with Tatiana, Grace and Estella and James and Pip. That dynamic there is just, it's so similar in like the coolest way because she just, she does it so differently. Like I feel like Cassandra Clare does such a good job of taking a classic and putting a twist on it because it doesn't feel like the same story necessarily. Like they're very distinct in my mind, but the parallels are just so strong. So we meet Tatiana Blackthorne in The Infernal Devices. Her husband dies, but for her coming into the Last Hours trilogy when she's like an older woman, she is just like, bent on revenge. This makes a lot of sense with Miss Havisham. So in Great Expectations, Miss Havisham is this old lady who lives in a house that she never cleans. It's like stuck in time. She is wearing her wedding dress that is yellowed with age because she has never ever changed out of it after she got stood up at the altar. So Tatiana and Miss Havisham are both very bitter people. I feel like even if they got their revenge, they would never feel like they could move on. And so they're using people and manipulating people to achieve that revenge, even though it will never be enough. In this case, Tatiana is using Grace a lot. So Grace, even though she lives with Tatiana as like a daughter, Tatiana does not treat her as a daughter. Like she's technically her ward. I honestly, I forget how they ended up living together. I don't remember how that worked exactly. But as far as Tatiana is concerned, Grace is just like a tool to be used against other people. That's sort of the same way that Miss Havisham has Estella, this beautiful little girl who lives with her. She sees Estella as a way to get revenge basically on all men <laughs> because her future husband stood her up at the altar and now she wants Estella to go and get men to fall in love with her and her to absolutely break them. And in both of these situations where Grace is being used and Estella is being used, it's messing up like the love lives of the next generation. <laughs> Pip is constantly focused on Estella who is just like very distant and cold to him, like especially when they first meet. So she wanted to have Grace make James fall in love with her as a means of getting revenge on the Herondales. And like Estella, Grace is very cold towards James, but he just has this constant love for her in a way that almost doesn't make sense. We find out that part of her manipulation is magic and Grace knows that, and but so does Estella. Estella obviously doesn't have magic. Great Expectations is like not urban fancy at all, but like both girls know what they're doing and they're sort of complicit in it for a very, very long time. A main reason of that is because like they are having a hard time leaving their guardians. Meanwhile, both James and Pip are sort of having this same emotion of like needing to earn the love of these girls. James feels like he has to prove himself to Grace and then Pip, he knows that proving himself would mean becoming very wealthy. Throughout both of their journeys, like they are being manipulated by the girls, but they're like overall being manipulated by these two older women who are just like out to destroy them really for no reason. It's not like Pip was the one who stood her up at the altar and it's not like James was there. When, like even born when any of this was happening for her when her husband died. But both of them have like such such long stories as <laughs> as James and Pip. They both go on forever trying so hard to like win the love of these girls and they it takes them so long to eventually both realize like this is not what I thought it was. Like they had 
overhyped it in their minds. In James's case, I feel like it wasn't his fault at all because like magic, but both of them have to come to this understanding of like what love truly is. And it's very much like a self-discovery journey. They both do have good like revelations towards the end of it. Where I enjoyed A Tale of Two Cities, I did not enjoy Great Expectations. That thing was long and I know why it was long because Charles Dickens had to write those little chapters for the newspaper. And the longer he wrote the story, the more money he made. So like get your bag, my dude, but oh my gosh, that thing dragged on forever. <laughs> and of course, I feel like I could not like not touch on the <laughs> the houses. Like I mentioned before, Miss Havisham, her house is the way it was the day that she was supposed to have her wedding. And it is truly disgusting. She has like the wedding table set out and all the food has been there since her wedding day and it's all rotted and there's these bugs and it is like unlivable truly. And she's wearing her wedding dress that has yellowed with age and sweat and grossness because she has never ever taken it off. The same thing happens with Tatiana when she is wearing her dress that she was wearing on the day that her husband had died with the hat and everything because they're both meant to be like stuck in time because neither of them could move forward. They are like very visibly and physically stuck in time because both of their houses, the, the clocks don't move and like nothing is ever truly clean and it's just a place of complete decay, which is meant to reflect their inner life, which obviously is going to mess up a child if they live there because for them, like yes, these older women, like they're stuck in this like cycle of reliving their trauma all the time. But for a child who's like actually growing and developing, like this sense of just being stuck in time is just gonna really mess with their heads, which I do think we see in Grace. I, I don't know if we're gonna get a redemption arc for her. I feel like, there was like a slight redemption arc for her at the end of the final Last Hours trilogy book, but there has got to be more coming because that just didn't feel like a, like a finish to me. It felt like her story just right here and like we need to know what happened. I hope I made my points for those two clearly. Like to me, it makes sense in my brain. Speaking it out loud is harder, <laughs> but this is where I need your help because the reason I hadn't made this video and I had wanted to for gen like years is because I felt like this theory was not complete. For the dark artifices and the mortal instruments, I don't know, I guess, enough Dickensian work to compare it to. So maybe there are parallels that I am not picking up because I haven't read those books and I'm sorry, I just I will not be doing that. <laughs> but if you have read more of Charles Dickens' work or other works in that time period that you feel are just like strong parallels, I would love to know. I would love to know. Because like with the mortal instruments, we all know that it started out as Harry Potter fan fiction. In my opinion, arguably a modern classic. And so if she's pulling from classic works to make her own trilogies and stories and stuff like that, I could see her pulling from Harry Potter as sort of model, not necessarily like she's copying it because I feel like she really does make something completely different. But that is the only parallel that I know of. The only other thing that I could think of is like, going way back, Romeo and Juliet star-crossed lovers situation. The reason they can't be together is their families. And we think for a good portion of the first couple books that the reason Jason Cleary can't be together is because they are family. <laughs> but considering that the other two are like Charles Dickens books, it just, those time periods, going from that and then like looking into Harry Potter or Romeo and Juliet, like that those just, are very different types of work, very different time periods. And then I was thinking about the dark artifices and I really couldn't think of anything. Like my my thought here is that Malcolm Fade, he goes, like he goes off his rocker. He loses the plot trying to bring Annabelle back. There absolutely has to be a classic story like that. Like someone going mad trying to bring their loved one back. Like the whole theme of him needing the blood of one of the Blackthorn children. I just, I feel like this plot has to be somewhere else in literature. And I just, I just don't know it. <laughs> the only classic piece that I could think of was A Cask of Montiato from Edgar Allan Poe, which I think that's in the right time period-ish because in that story, they bury someone alive. And obviously that is what happened to Annabelle. But the only reason they did that to Annabelle was because they found out who she was in love with, Malcolm Fade, a warlock that was not gonna fly, especially in her day. But when I think of Cask of Montiato, like we actually don't get a reason 
happened that the one guy gets buried alive. Like, he did something. Which, you know, maybe it's up to interpretation and it could have been a romantic issue between the two guys. Like, maybe they were fighting over somebody or something along those lines. Or, you're not good enough for my sister. Like, that type of thing. But I don't think we ever get any true, like, confirmation of why he killed the other guy. And nobody tries to bring anybody back from that. That's the only similar vibes that I could find. But other than that, I don't really know, like, what else to attach it to as far as, like, any type of story plot. I would love to hear from you. I know that there are comparative literature people out there who are going to be way better at this than me, so please let me know your thoughts in the comments. And if you're still here after this ramble, thank you so much for sticking around. <laughs> please like this video if you liked it, click subscribe if you want to talk about more book stuff. My name's Caitlin, thanks for watching. Bye!